Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we would now like to introduce the f our first of our poor, sorry, of our four pillar sessions, the bioeconomy people planet policies. Heading up this session is a person known as the father of the bioeconomy, Dr. Christian Passman. Christian has spent his long life and career predominantly focused on the forming and most importantly, the implementation of bioeconomy strategy in Germany. He now lends his vast experience to countries across Europe and the rest of the world as they go about creating their own strategies. Christian, we are delighted to have you with us. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Much for your kind words, I'm fine. Excellent, Excellent. Fantastic. 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 I'm going to leave, gonna leave, gonna leave, uh, gonna leave the floor to you. Well, thank you very much. Welcome everybody this morning, noon, afternoon, or in the evening, wherever you are. I welcome you very heartily to the fifth time that the session People, Planet, Policies Within the Bioeconomy is meeting. And uh, we are very proud of that, that this happens this year because it is the 10th anniversary of the European Union by economy strategy, the 10th anniversary also of the US strategy, the blueprint. And so in a more modest way, we are celebrating for the fifth time a meeting of this session. Now, dear friends, traditionally, the session is in two parts. The first one deals with some keynotes, one or two. And then in the second part, we have always a panel of selected speakers, which are concentrating on informing and discussing on the most recent by economy strategic elements and developments worldwide. So last year, when we were in the Brazilian state of Pará, and you heard just very interesting talk on the development in Brazil. In the last year, we had their people talking about the recent strategies in Colombia, Costa Rica, Portugal, East African Union, Indonesia, and also the autonomous region of Catalonia. This year, the group is a little smaller. It's China, Japan, United States, Finland, and Namibia. A very unique meeting and convention of people from four continents. Let's start with part one. As I said, we have today also two keynote speeches on very, very fascinating topics. The first one is, uh, I sloppily say, global governance of the bioeconomy, or more precisely, governing bioeconomy pathways. And the second one, a rather new topic for many, not for the experts, carbon management, which might transcend the bioeconomy. Let's come to global governance, the continuously growing number of strategies, action plans, and also of activities uh, in, uh, in lighthouse projects, etc., with uh, roadmaps. And they are all coupled with the ever-growing complexities of policies and also in other challenges to be responded to. They all these complexities lead to the very logical question, do we also need new governing, global governing bodies? Like, for example, we know already in trade, in biodiversity, in climate, in global changes, in environmental protection. And they might be embedded in a new word, in a new concept of biodiplomacy. And if that's the case, what are the right structures for that? like the Climate Secretariat, the United Nations in Bonn, where I live, with its famous IPPC, or simply new departments in FAO, UNEP, UNIDO, or are maybe regional solutions better one, which then are smartly linked in competence centers. And what should these new bodies or new body really do? And are there maybe initiatives like the World by Economy Forum or the Global Bioeconomy Summit also of interest. You see, very interesting topic. The second one is at least as interesting one, carbon management. We are going to look on the different aspects of carbon. This is the central role of the bioeconomy. 
renewable carbon and it's on its way to become a commodity in various aggregation. And we will look on the biological view, we look on the technical engineering view of it, also from the economic and maybe also from the financial ones. Carbon credits are in the area of interest for some people. All in all, carbon management. And how will the focus on that influence the strategic role of the bioeconomy of biological resources? If you look also to the next move to hydrogen, we are today mainly looking on the relationship between circularity and bio. But I think the bioeconomy lives in a much larger complex ambiente. So I'm proud that we have two excellent speakers here this morning. On topic one, it is Stefan Bösner, a true cosmopolitan citizen, if you look on his CV. He lives at this moment in Thailand, in Bangkok, works for the Stockholm Environmental Institute, has been working in Austria, UK, France, Lebanon, and lately in Thailand. And he is really an expert on all these extremely important topics like the energy transition, international land-based mitigation technologies and practices, etc. Dear Stefan, we are very curious on listening what you have to tell us on the global governance of the bioeconomy. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Christian, for your kind words and this nice introduction. I uh, try whether I can make the screen sharing work. Um, can I get a confirmation whether you can see my screen? Excellent. So um, as the Christian kind introduced me, my name is Stefan Bösner. I'm a research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute in Bangkok. And I think before we go uh, into the next session, into the nitty gritty details and some regional and national uh, experiences and developments as Christian mentioned, uh, maybe uh, uh, kindly allow me to give some international perspectives of how the bioeconomy could benefit from a little bit of more international cooperation. If so, uh, what kind of institutions and fora could help uh, the bioeconomy to deliver on its promise? Um, for those people uh, not necessarily uh, 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 that well versed in, in bioeconomy, let me just like briefly refresh your memory that the bioeconomy is truly a cross-cutting an increasingly global phenomenon. Um, Christian mentioned that uh, more than 40 nations and countries at the time have bioeconomy strategies and action plans in place. Uh, bioeconomy offers uh, a very cross-cutting lens uh, for future development uh, away from a fossil fuel-based economy to a bio-based economy. So this kind of cross-cutting nation is an, uh, an, uh, and this cross-cutting uh, um, uh, 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 cross-cutting in the nature of the bioeconomy is really something which I think we should keep in mind. Uh, just a few numbers, uh, around 13% of global trade actually is in bio-based goods and biomass. And in the energy sector alone, um, uh, the trade uh, wood pellets, the biofuels, for instance, almost doubled from 2004 to 2015, uh, which I think speaks to the international dimension of the bioeconomy. Here on the left, we have a graph uh, um, illustrating this kind of cross-cuttingness of the bioeconomy, uh, traditional biomass, biofuels, agroforestry, uh, biocosmetics. Uh, we've seen the trailers Christian mentions, really a cross-cutting phenomenon, the bioeconomy, which is becoming increasingly global. Um, but this kind of increasingly uh, global outlook on the bioeconomy should not hide the fact that there are different kind of visions uh, of what a bioeconomy can and should do. Um, I'm basing myself here on the works of colleagues, uh, they are in the source here, who tried to categorize um, different kind of bioeconomy strategies into these kind of three visions, so to speak. Of course, every categorization is arbitrary uh, um, and it's not clear cut, but this is just to give you an example, depending on which stakeholder you speak to, um, these stakeholders might have different visions of bioeconomy from a more technological innovation focused perspective on the left, to a more bioecology version on the right, uh, which emphasizes much more about diversity, conservation uh, aspects. And in the middle, you have this bioresource vision. Just like to give you an, an idea that not everybody uh, necessarily speaks uh, on the same thing when they speak about bioeconomy. Um, however, uh, uh, by, uh, um, um, apart from these kind of visions, 
Um, we also have to keep in mind that the bioeconomy is intrinsically linked to other agendas. Uh, we have it linked to the Sustainable uh, Development Goals, SDG 12, 15, and 10, for instance, more prominent, but other aspects as well. And of course, the bioeconomy is linked uh, to uh, the global climate change uh, mitigation adaptation agenda, which is one of the key aspects of this uh, World Bioeconomy Forum this year. Um, and here are some illustrative examples. For instance, the left picture uh, with the shovel is biochar, uh, where biomass is used to sequester carbon uh, in the ground. And I think Ole will then may, might speak to this. And then we have a Swedish example where biomass is burned for energy. Uh, the, the emissions are captured, uh, which is now known under the name of carbon capture and storage, which might be one solution for climate change mitigation. At the heart of this interconnectivity should always be the question is like, how can a bioeconomy contribute to a more equitable society where the benefits are spread more equally, but also the costs are spread more equally as well. Um, so this is just an overview to give an example of how international the bioeconomy has become. Now, some of you might think like, hmm, but bioeconomy is a rather a local endeavor. So haven't we heard like for the past couple of years, consume locally, produce locally. There's no need uh, uh, for like bioproducts to go travel around the globe, uh, which might be an approach. However, some issues, some barriers, some opportunities of the bioeconomy are truly transnational in nature. Think about land use change. And there is, for instance, some scientific evidence that when the European Union adopted the biofuel strategy, that this had an impact in Latin America where people start to grow biomass for biofuels, which had an impact on land use and land use change. A truly global phenomenon, so to speak. Biodiversity, food security, in the news right now with the Ukrainian war going on, um, these are truly transnational issues. Environmental pollution in, uh, in, and carbon sequestration as well. So these are just an, an exhaustive list, but just like some ideas of how bioeconomy uh, and the implementation of the bioeconomy strategies might indeed create some truly transnational issues. And if we accept that, and if we keep that in mind, then we could ask ourselves, well, could international institutions and international fora help um, to govern these kind of truly transnational issues? Uh, and uh, what we have learned so far is that every transition from one system to another needs a change of products practices and behaviors, and uh, uh, what we learned, for instance, from the energy transition, this kind of transition is much more efficient and effective if it's uh, embedded in a good policy framework, so to speak, and international institutions could help to embed the bioeconomy with a good governance and policy framework. And uh, again, on the right, we have uh, some arbitrary uh, uh, governance functions, uh, we, academ we academics, uh, we nerds, uh, sometimes we like to categorize uh, things. And uh, uh, governance is sometimes thought of market and trade governance, of knowledge and innovation governance, of informational governance, but also about agenda setting governance. I will speak to all four of these governance issues and make some suggestion where, which kind of forest institutions could help these uh, governance types uh, 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 and uh, uh, by a, a means of, of, of strengthening these governance types maybe to help the bioeconomy strategies to deliver on their problem, uh, pro, uh, promises. Um, for instance, market and trade governance could help to ensure a sustainable uh, flow of goods uh, and products of the bioeconomy and ensure food security, uh, for instance. This, again, look, high on the agenda. I'm very sorry. Um, right now, at the moment, um, I'd like to remind you that right now, uh, under the WTO, there is this environmental goods agreement is currently being negotiated. And some uh, bio-based products and some products relevant for the bioeconomy uh, uh, surely are on this list, on this list of uh, negotiations and, and of the, and this agreement. And so uh, the question might be asked, maybe uh, uh, another uh, agreement could be negotiated for the bioeconomy specifically. Um, there is this issue of fossil fuel versus green subsidies. Uh, uh, the fossil fuel regime, our current world, uh, favors unsustainable practices, favors uh, fossil fuel development, for instance, sometimes with subsidies, and therefore it's very difficult uh, for bioeconomy uh, uh, products and practices to compete. So maybe this is an issue which can be uh, addressed on an international level. Internationally uh, speaking, uh, market and trade governance can also ensure 
that there is uh, data-driven scenarios and pathways so grounded in science will give us a vision of where bioeconomy uh, is heading and where it should be heading, actually. And there are potential fora uh, which could do and assume this role. Um, again, this list is not exhaustive. Uh, we have the Gs, the G20, the G7. We have the WTO. We have the OECD. We have UNCTAD. All of these kind of fora sometimes already work on bioeconomy issues, but maybe they could step up their game and strengthen their uh, work on bioeconomy issues. Of course, there are challenges, like there's limited membership. Sometimes there's a lacking mandate, and the G7 represent a huge chunk of trade, but only a small fraction of nations, for instance. Um, these kind of fora are very focused on trade and markets. Maybe equity concerns, sustainability concerns are secondary or only tertiary to these kind of fora. This might be a challenge um, uh, when we talk about market and trade governance in bioeconomy pathways. Um, there's another aspect to the bioeconomy. Another thing is uh, uh, knowledge and innovation governance, for instance. It's very important for bioeconomy to be successful and to deliver on the promises that to exchange knowledge on policy frameworks and policy implementation. And I think the next session, uh, uh, which we will have uh, today, will maybe help us to get an understanding what helped to bring about successful bioeconomy initiatives uh, about in the respective countries. What are good practice examples and how can we share them internationally? This might be a task for knowledge and innovation governance. Um, knowledge and innovation governance can also elaborate guidelines and sustainability criteria with a global reach, for instance. It can facilitate technology and knowledge transfer, very important aspect for the global south, who sometimes still lack um, the technology and know-how to effectively deliver on bioeconomy pathways. There's intellectual property regulations which might uh, uh, advance or hinder bioeconomy pathways. And the fora here, uh, again, not exhaustive, uh, but just uh, to give you an idea, the FAO, for instance, UNDP, UNEP, IPO, the BioFuture platform, and others could help this knowledge and innovation governance. Again, there are challenges like a limited membership, a lacking mandate, and some of them are focusing only on one aspect, uh, energy fuels, for instance. And we heard uh, in the beginning when I mentioned that bioeconomy is truly cross-cutting. Uh, um, so maybe just focusing on one thing is not very appropriate. Maybe we should have a more a comprehensive lens. Um, informational governance, again, uh, the provision of standards and certifications would be very important uh, to ensure that bio-based products are truly sustainable. Um, the provision of information services and capacity building uh, to give stakeholders the opportunity and the capacity to deliver on bioeconomy governance could be indeed a, a, a task for international governance because we want to learn from many people, from many stakeholders in many parts of the world. Uh, again, here potential fora would be ISO, it would be the round table on sustain, sustainable uh, uh, bioproducts, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some fora who already work on these kind of issues, uh, 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 um, and maybe they can strengthen their uh, international aspect and, 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 and the, the, the governance of bioeconomy uh, issues. Again, challenges, some of them are industry focused, as I mentioned before. Again, there is a limited membership, but I think this shouldn't stop us to think more about how internationally we can collaborate more on bioeconomy uh, bio, uh, uh, pathways. And then the last point I would like, like to mention is the agenda setting governance. And sometimes, uh, um, fora like the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement are criticized for like uh, not being like having enough tooth, not enough sticks uh, besides the carrots, for instance. Uh, we know that the NDCs, the national determined contributions uh, by signatories of the Paris Agreement uh, are not uh, 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 sufficient to keep a global warming below two or 1.5 degrees. However, these kind of international fora set the agenda. They give us a direction. They give us a, a, a political will and a commitment to change things for the better. They set topics for future collaboration and research. They keep some issues on the agenda. So these kind of agenda setting bodies have a specific role to spur and uh, uh, translate uh, 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 um, declarations into actions. And we looked uh, in our paper, uh, which uh, we wrote, we looked at uh, potential for our, uh, potential homes in these kind of Rio conventions, UNFCCC, in the Convention of Biological Diversity, in the Convention to Combat Desification. And they work on other issues, of course, but maybe a bioeconomy could carve out some niche in these kind of bodies and uh, 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 be governed uh, under a gender setting perspective 
in this kind of forum. Again, the challenges reaching an agreement among so many participants and visions is difficult. There's, of course, the soft power aspect versus the power to regulate. Um, again, the Paris Agreement stipulates it's up to the, to the signatories to uh, uh, um, develop the NDCs, and everybody's free to do how they see fit uh, to deliver on these issues. Uh, uh, and maybe bioeconomy uh, uh, could use actually an international body governing bioeconomy pathways. It's a provocative question, uh, 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 and I don't have the answer yet, and maybe it can stimulate discussion, but should there be an international bioeconomy governance body like the UNFCCC, who deals exclusively with bioeconomy issues? Um, it is debatable, because right now, the time being, uh, there's, uh, we see less appetite for international cooperation. We should also be a very, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, we should be uh, wary of uh, um, the, 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 the the, the shortcomings of the Paris Agreement, for instance, how to ensure action and compliance, how to ensure a just representation in these kind of bodies, and how do we get from negotiation and declaration to uh, adoption and implementation. Um, so maybe if the, an international bioeconomy governance body is not yet on the cards, maybe a regional approach would be a good solution. And there, and I hope we'll hear this throughout the forum here, there are some regional bodies like the European Union, for instance, who have adopted regional bioeconomy strategies, but also East Africa has now a regional bioeconomy strategy. So maybe get a step down and look at the regional level how to uh, 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 cooperate more on bioeconomy pathways. Uh, uh, and I would like to finish uh, my presentation on uh, uh, some key aspects, uh, because somebody might be asking themselves, but why is uh, regional cooperation or international cooperation even beneficial? Well, as I mentioned in my introduction already, transnational issues such as land use change, biodiversity, food security, need truly transnational cooperation. Um, regional cooperation could lead to the pooling of resources and political clout, especially again relevant for the global south, where resources are scarce, uh, uh, and political clout in negotiation fora and in international fora. For instance, if you agree regionally on one position, maybe you have more clout internationally than if you take up your regional grievances and your regional perspectives to the international level. Um, regional uh, cooperation might enable the Global South to take advantage of similarities, but also complementarities, for instance. Knowledge, knowledge technology, and know-how transfer is very important for the Global South and SDG delivery and can be facilitated by regional cooperation. Of course, the learning across jurisdictions could facilitate innovation. And of course, one major aspect of regional cooperation is to ensure that countries actually reap the benefits from high value added end of the value chain instead of remaining exporters of biomass, which you have seen traditionally, there are some countries who simply export the biomass and then uh, uh, the, the economic benefits of the higher value added products and goods are reaped elsewhere. Uh, uh, so maybe regional cooperation could build markets, uh, uh, could foster innovation so that these kind of countries traditionally being only, only exporters can also reap the benefits of the higher values. Um, and of course, a better information exchange helps deliver on all of these pathways more efficiently. And I think this is one of the crucial aspects of this forum and why we're gathered together here uh, today, virtually in Finland and across the globe, to facilitate an exchange of information about back practice examples and to learn from each other how we could deliver uh, more sustainable bioeconomy strategies. I will stop here. I will thank you for, my, uh, for your attention and I will yield the floor to my competent colleagues. Thank you very much. Well, well thank, thank you very, very much, dear Stefan, for an excellent and extremely convincing plea that the bioeconomy needs a common global institutional home, if I may say so. That has been very convincing, the more than as you rightly put out at the beginning, the bioeconomy is, well, practically everywhere. Soupoudré, as the French would say. You find it everywhere that makes it powerful, but also weak. So I would love to have some comments on that later on by the question, but I have one question to you immediately. As this is a very complex matter, what would be your suggestion to start to get the necessary global attention for starting somewhere on such a discussion, which might end 
finally in the establishment of a new body or linking new bodies together? Oh, thank you very much. This is an excellent question. Um, for me, um, given the less appetite for international cooperation, as I mentioned, I think the discussions have to start locally and regionally. Uh, and we see some steps uh, 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 to be made in this direction with the East African strategy, for instance, now in place. Uh, I think uh, uh, um, sometimes these kind of connections, you, you rightfully point out that bioeconomy is everywhere. It permeates every, every part of our economy. I think making this clear to people is one of the first steps to think like, oh, if it's such complex and so connected to everything else, maybe some international fora or some international governance body might be uh, uh, um, uh, 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 on the cards. And I think the Rio conventions actually and uh, uh, um, meeting, and meeting uh, in the sense of the, the COPs, for instance, would be a good start also but also the the the, the forum that we are are in in, in right now uh, the the world bioeconomy forum the global bioeconomy summit is exactly where uh, 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 people uh, should start to have these conversations and they bring all the stakeholders together uh, i've seen on the program we have like people from the private sector also from the public sector and i think these kind of fora uh, 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 just discuss debate exchange ideas and then when we agree on these kind of common vision then uh, uh, start thinking which kind of fora uh, would be uh, either uh, appropriate or maybe then a gather a, a, a club of like-minded uh, uh, nations, for instance, uh, uh, which was, had happened in the climate change uh, uh, um, field. But we did, they called climate clubs, where ambitious nations gather together and, 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 and form a club which is more ambitious than the rest. And so that would be uh, then the next step. But I think for uh, like the World Bioeconomy Forum and the Global Bioeconomy, so these are the key first steps to do City, it's kind of uh, uh, um, 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 information and best practice exchange. Well, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to some more questions later on, uh, but that has been an excellent start. We now come to the second keynote. As I said, the topic is global, uh, is carbon management. And Ole Marvik is our speaker. He is a special advisor for life sciences at a mechanism and organism called Innovation Norway, which is the main agency for industry development in Norway. Very powerful, by the way. He has a PhD in molecular biology, but also a master's degree in business. So very well qualified. And uh, he is very strongly involved also in OECD matters, as I know. And I'm very happy that we have such a competent author today to talk us about carbon management. Ole, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, for those kind words. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Let me now try to share my screen. So does that work? OK, great. So what I thought I should do today would be to uh, share with you some thoughts on, as <coughs> Christian said, carbon management and that how that relates to the bioeconomy. Um, change slide, yes. Yeah. And the, um, and the starting point for this discussion is actually this, um, I would say, rather gloomy uh, picture here, showing that we are currently, without going into details, uh, using more fossil carbon in human activities than biocarbon, including then food and feed, but just leave out grassland. And if we look at the energy aspects, uh, it's actually the double. And all this fossil carbon we need to get rid of in 30 years. That talks about the magnitude of scale here. And this has been also been recently confirmed for Europe by the commission uh, publication last year. 55% of carbon is fossil, 45 is biogenic. As it's interesting also to note that on the carbon um, requirements, uh, materials and chemicals currently most fossil are almost at the same magnitude as food and feed. 
And also to get a further grip on the magnitude of scale here, I'd like to share with you this example. It's from the UK, the biggest power station in the UK, providing about 7% of the grid power. Originally, it was built for coal, now uh, uh, refitted for wood pellets. And that's all very good, but it's still is interesting and uh, perhaps a bit shocking for me to see that it uses currently almost the same amount of wood that is logged in Norway. And, 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 and Norway considers itself to be a forest rich country. So when we lean on the bioeconomy to replace all the fossil, we have to keep in mind that while for the synthesis is the best evolution has come up with, it's still very resource intensive. It needs land, water, fertilizers, and so on. And, and if you um, uh, compare it, say, with a commercial sun panel, it is not a very efficient collector of sun energy either. So the question arises, is there enough land available to produce all the biomass we may need? And what I hear is that for most, for most uh, parties, the answer is no. And this will lead to competition for land. The need, the requirements for climate change versus food security versus biodiversity and also regional development. As also alluded to by, by Stefan in the previous talk. And when OECD looks at this, they point out that while doing you know, a, a carbon footprint assessment, that's a technical or scientific process. However, when you are to value or, or, to, or to, to, to evaluate uh, or balance the different sustainability objectives, that is a value-based process or endeavor. And, and therefore, it involves politics and ethics. And probably also the reason why it's so difficult to get the unified consensus globally on these matters. Now, this image here is for me as a biologist, well, it's life. <laughs> it's the chemistry of life. This redox process that's been going on for 3 billion years continuously, hopefully will continue for a while still, where carbon bound to oxygen, is then changed into carbon bound to hydrogen with the help of sun energy. Now, this has some practical consequences. And you can see this in a, this fun Krevlin diagram, so it calls, where the hydrogen content of a carbon molecule is on one axis and the oxygen content on the other axis. So you find then methane, up in the upper left corner, and, and, and then the other extreme, the energy poor CO2 in the lower right. Now, fossil resources are then uh, nicely placed up here, very rich in energy and, and lacking oxygen. While biomass is somewhere in the middle. And this means when you want to replace fossil with biomass, you first need to grow it uh, and then add more energy to bring it up to the same quality as the fossil. And if you're lacking land, well, you have to go all the way from CO2. So these are the alternatives we have at our disposal. The limited biogenic resources, then we need to add to this recycling of all available concentrated carbon sources, solid waste, as well as uh, carbon gases from the industry, say. And eventually, we also probably will need to industrialize what plants do, capturing CO2 directly from air and use that as a feedstock. This is the alternatives. We have probably no, 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 not more than that. And this is what the OECD talks about when they 
talk about carbon management. It's the integration of the bioeconomy, carbon recycling, and renewable energy that is necessary to drive these processes. And these parts here should not be separated. It should be looked upon as one entity in policy making because they are so closely connected. And that brings me to my first recommendation. It seems rather obvious. If you have a limited bioresource, you should use it for those applications where its unique properties and molecular complexity are most appreciated. And you should probably, well, you should definitely not burn it and probably not use it for simple chemical building blocks either. And that is what we see in the um, in this graph here from the Chemical Association in Germany, that well, biomass will be used in the in the first part of the transition, but as we go, go on, carbon dioxide will be the predominant feedstock. Now I'd like to share with you an example from my home country, um, aquaculture. Norway is producing about 50% of the salmon <coughs> consumed globally, uh, 1.3 million tons. And it's also expected that this uh, production will increase dramatically, actually, uh, by four, three or four times in the years to come, which makes us very dependent on a resource for sustainable feed. Currently, we are very dependent on soy, but soy has a bad reputation when it comes to deforestation and also a, a rather poor CO2 footprint. So we are looking for alternatives. And the most promising alternative, at least when it comes to scaling, is gas fermentation. Here in this particular bacteria can grow on CO2 as the sole carbon source, use hydrogen, as for energy and a, boost, a little bit oxygen to boost the process. And it produces, well, itself, the cells, and containing 70% protein, which have been shown to be very well suited for fish feed, but also, in fact, directly in food. And you can actually see the same thing. Uh, this is also um, uh, the conclusion of this uh, very good paper from PNAS last year, where they looked at the protein yield from one hectare of land, potentially, using three different approaches. And the first one is so the base case, there's cultivation of soy, and they look into the FAO database and say, what's the average yield? And that's about one ton per hectare. However, if you instead grow a sugar crop, sugar beets, say, and you take those sugars and ferment them into single cell protein, well, then you can almost triple the yield of protein. However, if you instead cover 70% of this area with sun panels and take that energy uh, to produce hydrogen by electrolysis of water and capture CO2 directly from air and ferment that, gas fermented, just as we said it saw in the previous slide, well, you actually get 15 tons per hectare, 15 times the direct cultivation of the soy crop, uh, protein crop soy. So, so, so then that is, uh, uh, you know, my second recommendation that when land is limited, we should use it wisely and smartly and uh, see how we can um, perhaps use other methods in addition to complement the bio production. Aviation uh, is also one of those uh, sort of so-called hard to abate sectors. And it's been calculated that if you uh, were to use say sunflower oil to produce the required uh, aviation fuel consumed in Europe, you would need 60% of European arable land. 
And of course, that won't work. So that's why we, in the IA scenarios, see that as for the chemicals, they, they will start with bioresources, but eventually, from say 2040 onwards, it will be the synthetic fuels, the e-fuels, that will grow most. So my third recommendation is that we need to find alternatives to complement bioproduction, circulate concentrated carbon gases, also capture CO2 directly from air, and use hydrogen as the energy source, either green hydrogen or so-called low, so low emission hydrogen to produce what you might call syn gas. Um, you see the formula here. It is a general feedstock that could replace naphtha in all sorts of production, like fuel, chemicals and polymers, food and feed. So before I come to a close here, I just wanted to share this image with you, uh, which I really like. It shows the long view, where petroleum economy is sort of blip in history. But in this period, we have done two things which are very important. First of all, we have become 10 times more people. And secondly, we have industrialized society. And this means that our carbon demand is very different from it was before. So the new bio-based economy will be a different uh, bio-based economy than we had in the past. And some of you may remember this publication uh, from 2009, where they really described the OECD, described the bioeconomy and the importance of it, and envisioned how this will develop. Now, OECD says that this is all good, but we still need to, now we need to expand the view to include all different types of carbon based value chains, also including what I have not talked about. Uh, uh, carbon dioxide removal, so CDR, and combine this under the framework or umbrella of carbon management. So this is the depicts the carbon management concept. It's very important that the energy part is included. And to sum up the take home messages here, my point is that there are dilemmas. When we are developing the toolbox of policies, like Stefan alluded to, we need to also be aware of the dilemmas. Biodiversity loss is just as irreversible as climate change. So how do we weigh these values relative to each other? Recycling carbon and direct air capture requires a lot of energy. And this may interfere with electrification of other sectors. So we see here how a, an energy crisis is looming. We can see this in Europe nowadays, for instance. And finally, we should not, um, we shouldn't forget the social aspects. The green transition will be a bumpy road. And so we need to balance the urgency of climate action with the po potential for economic instability and social unrest. So I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Dear Ola, this has been really going back to basics. You know, you showed us, you know, where we come from and also where we should go. And that is even adding to already existing complexities, believe me. But we will have to live with that and we will have to transform these complexities into understandable policies. And uh, therefore, I'm very grateful to you that you were throwing uh, not just a stone, but a brick into a pond and that we are going to discuss that. Uh, before I'm giving uh, uh, the floor also to some questions from the audience, if possible. I have one question to you, and that is, you are perfectly right in describing the traditional bioeconomy, which we had before, but then we arrived with the knowledge-based one plus, 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 plus. What about 
proteins? And what about hydrogen? The bioeconomy is just much more than carbon. And therefore, my question to you is, and we have to really to cope with these questions, what will be in the end the overall picture where the different roles of the bioeconomy within the circles you described are to be found? And my second point here, this is the toolbox of options. People in Latin America, where they have a lot of space and a lot of biomass, will talk about the potentials of the bioeconomy for their own economy in a different way than people in Iceland or in Sri Lanka. So how are we able also to reckon with these diversified elements the world is not one big bioeconomy solution. There is not the bioeconomy as such. Again, thank you very much for this great contribution. That's my question. Well, had I had the answers to that. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I think to your first question, I think the key, that's why I also spent some time on, on pointing to the carbon um cycle as an energy cycle mm -hmm. because uh, i think that's uh, to some extent often overlooked um bio production is is sun energy collection yeah. um so so from that sort of thermodynamic perspective you need to um look at how you should optimize mm -hmm. the production we need for the future then my point is also was that biology should be used where the unique properties of biology mm -hmm. is, 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 is can be it can be maximized um, and that's why i'm very concerned about using biomass simply for collecting energy and burning it and the energy aspects of using biomass as a feedstock, say in the chemical industry, that needs additional energy to be in, put in. And, and therefore, I think we should, um, we've asked IEA if in their scenarios, whether they have taken account of the, that energy uh, that's needed to keep the, to, to, to sort of mobilize the bio resources. Uh, in in for some of these products, and I think that's uh, some of the, the so uh, some some knowledge still needs to be um, mm -hmm. be developed there. So so my point, I think in conclusion, I think there are so many different types of products where biology is definitely best suited. You mm -hmm. mentioned protein and fibers and and bioactives and so on. So let's focus on that in the bioeconomy and then try to use other means to mm -hmm. develop some of these other value chains and support them. Now, when it comes to the, 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 your second question, you're absolutely right. There are the strategies will not be the same in all parts of the, of the globe. There, there are, I, I try to refer to it that, you know, some of these dilemmas is related to the justified needs for regional de development. And all regions will have different types of resources. And there might even be, you know, say, uh, competition for these resources, which will affect international trade and so on. It might be even a security aspect to those resources. But I, I think, and, and some resources are, well, biomass. Another resource might be just simply energy that can replace uh, bio uh, in some respects. So, so each region need to develop their carbon strategy for producing mm -hmm. carbon-based mm -hmm. products. Yeah. Uh, and there will be differences in strategies but still, I hope that we can all unify in a sort of some of these overarching and, and, and general principles that you need to balance, uh, at least from a global perspective, 
balance the different value-based aspects of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Maybe another question, microorganisms. Is it not a conclusion of your talk that we might and should stress much more the relevance of microorganisms in the whole process? Well, I, I think so, uh, because microorganism, microbial production yeah. can be more energy efficient once you have the energy. Uh, so again, the question is, can we provide enough renewable energy? Well, in this case, That's a lot right. of production can be taken care of in an efficient manner by microorganisms, but also chemically. Mm -hmm. so, so, so there are various uh, pathways here in our toolbox. Mm -hmm. Stefan, do you have any questions to your colleague? Um, not a question. It was very interesting, these kind of different... Uh, 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 how much protein for how much land? Yeah, uh, uh, very very interesting. But I'm 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 just like want to completely agree um, on the importance of how to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, use uh, resources efficiently. And then another reflection um, on the fact that yes, there it's such a diverse topic, and so many countries pursue different kind of visions. And what I wanted to say is that like just because there is some international governance perspectives or like some maybe some institutions who take a little bit more hands-on approach, that does not mean that we should pursue one size fits all uh, uh, approaches. So we should give countries uh, wiggle room and some leeway and some 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 freedom to pursue uh, the bioeconomy they see most fit for their uh, 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 jurisdiction and their geographic and socioeconomic uh, uh, backgrounds. Which is something. I would like to stress maybe that not, not, not one size fits all rarely works. You have to take the regional and national specifications into consideration. That would be nice. Thank you very much for this con uh, content. Are there at this moment any questions from the audience? And is there a way that they are being transformed forward, forwarded to us? So, yes, please. There's one important question coming up as is it not better to use the biomass more and more for a re recycling material loop, more in a chemical way to use the biomass more in a chemical way than instead of using it simply for energy? Well, that, that's, that's a question for Ole. Yeah, Stefan, maybe you can say something. I yield the floor to Ole because he is much more. No, no, it's, it's for Ole. I, I'm going to tell him. Ole, Ole is going to, to, to give this to give an answer to this question. Well, bioresources can, in many cases, for instance, fiber can be used cascadingly. I think that's very important. You can you can you can use it and then recycle it in a shorter loop before it's released into the atmosphere as CO2 again. So. So, so, so there are some some aspects of of, of and, and benefits of using biomass. But again, I think it's still important that we look quite neutral on on on, on carbon pathways and, and look at carbon in the center. So biomass is one aspect of the carbon cycle, uh, and and we should be really use it smartly. That's, that's my, my point. Mm -hmm. um, um, it, it's, it's, it will be, you know, in many cases, bio will be the best alternative, but not all. And, and how to decide that will depend, depend on many indicators, energy efficiency, carbon efficiency, as well as the influences of these other um, um, uh, value-based aspects like biodiversity, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I think it all boils down to a competition for land. Land is the limited resource. Energy and land, that's the two key limited resources. Mm -hmm. And what about water? Well, definitely also water in the case of bio. But uh, again, I think most of the conflicts uh, now we see on, on, on bio is, is related to conflicts on land. Uh, but but that, uh, definitely water is also important. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? No, thank you. Not more. Not more. Then I'd like to finish uh, with uh, some words. Uh, first, I I think that.
both topics are of utmost importance. And uh, this is just the beginning that we have to introduce a more intensified discussion on them. Uh, in the in some fora, like the Global Bioeconomy Summit, and uh, the question of to what extent an international body uh, might be found is already being discussed for some time, but it has been fading away for the time being. And I'm very glad that evidently this discussion is now being reduced, renewed. Also coupled with stronger efforts to introduce by economy into the different agenda of different bodies, what you call about the agenda setting governance. By the way, uh, Stefan, I'm very grateful to you that you were categorizing these governance uh, styles a little. That is very, very helpful. So I think this is a very important start, you know, on a discussion. And I hope that from this forum, there might be a new impetus for renewing these discussions where we also find uh, where we also find the government officials to have their role in to present these cases in international fora. With respect to carbon, it's even I think at least as important that we clarify that we clarify the position of the bioeconomy within this broader transcending context order you just outlined to us. This is extremely important. It's not only, a, let me say, an academic strategic question. It boils very much down to very practical ones. I simply want to mention that at this moment in the textile industry, there is, a, in Europe at least, is a big discussion to what extent the recycling and reuse of textile is something which makes sense in many, 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 many dimensions, because the energy which use and also the water, I'm repeating my word water, for the recycling process are immense and normally are not taken into account. And French are already talking about the so-called enzymatic recycling. I find that a very interesting new direction in order to optimize in the widest sense these these questions and these dimensions and these issues and processes so it's not just as i said something of academic value it goes down very much to practical solutions and in this sense i thank both speakers extremely for their wonderful contribution really very much it is a fantastic start into our topical discussions in this fifth by economy world forum thank you very much and i give the floor back to the organizers So welcome back, everybody, and of course to Yuka and Ada. Yeah, Ada Hello. is with us. There you are. Excellent. So, I mean, I think it's been fantastic. What, what do you think so far, Ada? Oh my God, I couldn't uh, stop listening. It's been very interesting. Um, well, let's start with Stevan a little bit. Um, I found very interesting when he talked about the challenge of market and trade, about the lacking clear mandate. You know the, how how a lot of it, a lot of bioeconomy policies right now focus so much on the economy <coughs> and not on so much on sustainability, for example. You know, like I, I've mm. seen from this part of the world and in, in Southeast Asia and Asia and also um, uh, Australia, it's perceived as a jar, is another jargon, you know? So mm. we need to, mm. how, the question is, how do we, how, what can we do to socialize what, bio, what bioeconomy is, mm. you know, to have to create better understanding. And another thing that Stefan mentioned about, you know, like provision of standard and certification, it makes me think, you know, like how can we embrace other existing certifications already exist right now? There's so many certification for so many different fiber source, like for trees, for example, there are already a forest stewardship council, there's a PFC. Mm. How, what is the role of other certification in it, for example? Uh, Ole is very, very interesting as well. Um, mm. 
it's just so much information that I could absorb. Uh, what he said about bioproduction is a sun energy collection, you know, uh, this, the, therefore we should not burn it. It's just like mm -hmm. mind blowing. Um, and the sustainability, the fact that sustainability goals are in fact in conflict and how, what, what the role of, of bioeconomy industry and in creating the balance, you know, the, uh, because the land is limited, <clears throat> And uh, how we create the balance within production, biodiversity, and also the use of uh, indigenous peoples. I think that's a very good, um, um, you know, thing to 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 think about. And uh, I think it's our role to try to figure out how to resolve it as well, Mark and Yuka. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yuka, indeed. Uh, I don't have not that much to add. So I think that okay, we were touching upon with the very huge topics, very huge mm. topics that, okay, both in the okay, Ules and okay, Stefan presentation, while Stefan was talking about that, okay, whether there need to be a sort of, let's say, pivotal, maybe organization, which is gathering all these under the bioeconomy mm. topics, who uh, remind the BC, I think that okay, we will still talk about these topics during these days. And, uh, mm. and on the other hand, that, okay, it was very good that, okay, uh, Ule reminded about it's not only the bioeconomy, it's about the par carbon management. So I think that this is then okay, the reminding that, okay, we need to have a coexistence. No one can do that alone. Bioeconomy cannot do that alone. Fossil, okay, uh, uh, economies cannot do that alone. That, okay, we need to have a coexistence. So I think that we are revisiting that topic during these days because we have uh, speakers from the both end and also for the industrial end. So I, I think it was a okay, marvelous startup. Yeah, yeah. For these days. Yeah. Uh, I liked um, um, Christian's comment at the end about textile recycling. Ah. You know, it's all well and good and it's fantastic yeah. if you're not using too much water. But if you, you've got to find ways around this, this is so yeah. much innovation needs to be done really yeah, yeah. in Indeed. so many different ways. Indeed. Yeah. So, yeah, I think an excellent beginning yep. to the first session, really. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. This so, a wealth, a wealth of information. Very, yeah. very good. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Really good. Yep. Great start to the whole day. Yep. Why don't we just something? Yeah. So next is coffee break. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, we're going to have a coffee break and then we're going to be back at 11 o'clock our time, which is in around about a half an hour. So yeah. thank you very much. See you then.